Hi, I'm Sean Dietrich, and you are listening to the Sean of the South podcast. I'm coming to you from a cabin way out in the middle of the woods of South Alabama. I'm watching butterflies, and they're flying around the longleaf pines and the live oaks. A butterfly seems to have it all figured out, if you think about it. They fly, and they don't seem to have much of a purpose behind it. They just enjoy what they're doing. One could do worse than watching butterflies in the middle of the South Alabama woods. It's nice weather. The sun is shining. And while I talk to you, I am getting quite a sunburn on my right forearm. I'm sitting at a desk, and I've got this sandwich which was made for me by my wife. She wrapped it in butcher paper. I wasn't quick enough to eat it, and so it has been overtaken by ants. I guess they needed a little more than I did. Philip and Rena McConnell had been married for 65 years. 65 years. Things had changed a lot in 65 years. Fashion had changed. Cars had changed. Philip was a car enthusiast. He loved his cars. He spent many, many nights and evenings out in his little one-car garage, which was detached from the house. It was a garage he'd built himself with tin roofing and clapboards. He passed many decades of his own life and his son Chet's life out in that garage. They were close in Chet. Of course, Philip wasn't the same as he'd always been. He was slipping. And Rena didn't want to admit that he had Alzheimer's because to her that was still a very modern word. Sixty-five years ago they called it different things. She was content just to call it old age. But still, it hurt her nonetheless. She would look at Philip sitting there in his easy recliner and he would give her this flat look that seemed like he had eyes with nothing behind them she'd say do you know who I am at times he did at times he could remember everything about their life and at times he didn't but she existed to keep him comfortable. Their marriage had changed from being a marriage of two people, shouldering a load, raising kids, making a life together. It had changed to one woman taking care of a man who may or may not have Alzheimer's. In fact, Rena mowed the lawn. She didn't mind it, truth be told. It was her only form of exercise. Well, just a week before she had painted the garage, she crawled up on a ladder, and with a Campbell soup can that was filled with white lead paint that had been sitting on the shelf since the early 60s, she painted the old clapboards, which were cracked and faded. Philip had wandered out of the garage, and he looked at her. She looked down at him, and paint was dripping on his forehead. He wiped it off and he licked his finger. She said, don't do that. He looked up at her with eyes that were just as innocent as snow in January. And he said, where am I? Huh. Doctors diagnosed Raina McConnell with a tumor. They said it was dangerous, and it needed to come out. And because of her age, surgery was a, a risk, no matter how invasive or how non-invasive. Her body just wasn't as spry as it used to be. She insisted that she was in good shape, that she only smoked five cigarettes a day. She held herself to that very, very carefully. She was a woman of standards and discipline. She told the doctors that she spent plenty of time out in the yard gardening and pushing her mower. She explained that she had just recently painted 
her garage. The doctor told her he needed to know that she had someone to take care of her after surgery. Well, Philip wasn't up to the job. Philip could hardly remember who she was, what state he was in, let alone take care of her. She was the one who took care of him. She called her daughter, who lived in Birmingham. She didn't live far from UAB. They scheduled surgery, and Philip and Raina McConnell were going to stay with their daughter. After Raina loaded the car, the Cadillac Eldorado, which Philip had once picked out from the newspaper classifieds, the same Cadillac Eldorado he worked on, sometimes still. They set off for Birmingham in mostly silence. She looked over at Philip, who was looking out the window, and he seemed lost. He seemed as though he was in another world. Ever since his mind had started to leave him, he'd quit letting the bits of his personality show through. She wondered if it was because the things that came out of his mouth most often were so nonsensical, so telling of how feeble his mind was, that they left him embarrassed. And even though he had a hard time remembering exactly who he was, he could still feel embarrassment. And Philip McConnell had been graced with a healthy ego, which could not tolerate embarrassment. And so he was silent. At times she feared that she'd lost him. Oh, sure, he was there with her. And he sat in his recliner eating and drinking and keeping calories in his body which would sustain his life. But he was not there. She pulled over into a gas station. She filled the car. Funny, Philip used to be the one who filled the car on road trips. She walked into the gas station and she bought a small package of peanuts for 72 cents and she bought a Coca-Cola in the bottle. She knew how much Philip loved peanuts inside of a Coca-Cola. Poor man's lunchbox, he used to call it. She wandered out to the car and she saw a silhouette in the driver's seat. <laughs> it was Philip. He sat behind the steering wheel, both hands at ten and two o'clock, with the car running. She opened the passenger door. She slid in to the passenger seat. She didn't want to lose her temper at him, but she said, Philip, you can't drive. You don't have your license. He looked at her and he smiled. He said, how about just this once, baby? They had revoked his license, of course. It was a nasty episode. She woke up one morning and Philip was nowhere to be seen in the house. She called the cops. They searched the city for him. And when they found him, he was in their subdivision at the little public park, watching children swing on the monkey bars, watching kids play on the swing set. And when the cops had rapped on his window, he rolled it down. And they said, Mr. McConnell. He only looked at them with a blank stare and said, I don't know where I am. And here he was in the driver's seat. Raina knew she shouldn't let him drive. It was four hours left to Birmingham still. She knew it was a bad idea. But something in his eyes looked clear. Something in his eyes looked knowing. He seemed more awake than he'd ever been before. Sometimes his episodes of wakefulness only lasted for 15 or 20 minutes. She knew it was a bad idea to let him drive, but something about the way he looked at her made her feel so safe. And it was a feeling she hadn't experienced in many years. So, she let him drive. 
She reclined in the passenger seat and became twenty-five years younger. Then she smiled. First thing she did was open the peanut package and pour the peanuts inside the glass Coca-Cola bottle. She put her thumb in the mouth and she turned the bottle upside down and watched the peanuts swirl with the dark, sweet syrup. Then she took a sip. That taste is something that can't be duplicated, and it reminded her of the old days. The days when she and Philip were much younger, when they used to take road trips with the family, just for the hell of it. Long before Chet had passed. Long before their world had been painted with darkness, back when Philip still worked on his own cars. At the hospital, Philip was still himself. In fact, he'd been himself now. She timed for eight hours. He had unloaded the car when they reached their daughters. He had helped her settle into their room. He'd eaten lunch with her and had conversation about the old days. He drove her to the doctor's appointment. He helped her in to UAB and up to the doctor's office on the 10th floor. And when the doctor explained to her what would be happening for surgery, Philip looked thoughtfully at the man. He asked pertinent questions about the surgery itself. The next day, they woke early. She rolled over in bed to look at Philip, and she expected his eyes to be blank, but they weren't. He was looking right back at her, and he smiled and said, You can do this, baby. He drove her to the hospital. When they reached the curb, the nurse stood there with a wheelchair. She said, it's hospital policy. We can't let you walk to surgery. We must wheel you. Philip said, let me park the car. I'd like to wheel my wife into surgery. And he did. He parked his Cadillac Eldorado. He trotted through the parking lot. She hadn't seen him move that way in years. She sat on the chair. He rolled her to surgery, or at least to the waiting room. He put his old hand on her shoulder, and he said, I love you, and I have always loved you. She touched his hand. She didn't know exactly what to say. She didn't want to die, not by surgery. She didn't want to leave, not while he was clear. She kissed his hand. The nurse came and wheeled her back. Surgery was a success. When she got into her recovery room, Philip was there, sitting in the corner with his legs crossed. She inspected his eyes and expected them to be still and placid, but they were alive. He rose and he greeted her. He kissed her cheek, and for three days of recovery, they watched the television, which hung in the corner. They played cards from a pack of playing cards Philip had bought from the downstairs gift shop. He took her home. He drove six hours and thirty minutes in that Cadillac Eldorado with her in the side seat and took her home. He helped her inside. He put her in bed. He even made her a grilled cheese sandwich and a tomato soup straight from the can. That night, just before she fell asleep, she let her old veiny hand rest on his white hair and she said I've missed you so much he said I've missed you too the next morning she awoke and she felt a whole lot better than she thought she would the doctors had scared the bejesus out of her they led her to believe that recovery could take months and months but really she felt pretty good she wandered out into the living room, keeping her balance on a cane. 
as she saw Philip in his recliner. She said, Good morning, Philip. His head slowly turned to look at her, and his eyes were blank. The two blue eyes, which had once fallen in love with hers, were blank. But she did not grieve. She limped toward him, and she kissed his forehead. He didn't say anything. He only looked at her as if to say, Who are you? She whispered into his ear, I love you so much. He only gave her a half smile. Sixty-five years. Sixty-five years of marriage. Thanks for listening to the Sean of the South podcast. I'm your host, Sean Dietrich. You can find out more about me at seanofthesouth.com. And while you're there, drop me a line. I enjoy hearing from my friends. And speaking of friends, may the good Lord bless our friends. And may he turn the hearts of those who are not our friends. And if he cannot turn the hearts of those who do not love us, may he turn their ankles. Adios.